Well, to get, from, to get to Cana from Capernaum, you'll need to travel 20 miles southwest from the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee. It's all uphill. Capernaum was the center of Jesus' ministry in Galilee. Jesus was active in the synagogue there. He healed a Roman soldier's son there in Matthew and in Luke. He cast out demons there and he taught there. He ministered to people out of his disciple Peter's house, which was also there in Capernaum. Capernaum was where all the action happened. It was a border town which made it likely that royal officials like the one that we meet today kept offices there to oversee all the commerce and all the trade and all the tax collecting that passed through. The importance of understanding why Capernaum was central to the healing and teaching ministry of Jesus is most evident in the fact that Jesus cursed the town in both Matthew and Luke for rejecting him. That may be why the gospel writer of John places Jesus in Cana not in Capernaum for his coming out party when Jesus transformed water into wine. And it also may be why Jesus initially brushed off the begging plea of the royal official to come down to Capernaum and save his son. Oh, you people, all you want is signs and wonders. The gospel writer never tells us if the royal official was a Jew or Gentile, but we are told that he was from Capernaum, the place Jesus would curse for paying no mind to the arrival of God on two feet in time and in person. The royal official represents the town that Jesus would come to reject, and in his day job, he represents the interests of King Herod, the king who beheaded Jesus' friend John the Baptist, the king who sent wise men to chase down Mary, Joseph, and Jesus, the king who plotted with the Romans to capture and crucify Jesus. So a royal official from Capernaum that works for King Herod really shouldn't bother making the 20-mile, two-day journey uphill to Cana to ask Jesus for help. But here he is, worn out, from walking alone nonstop. Here he is, already grieving the likely death of his young son. Here he is, unable to use his elevated social status or his kingly connection to save his son from imminent death. Here he is, down on his knees, begging, begging Jesus to get up I know you just got here. You're in Judea. You've traveled a long ways. You're resting. You just got here. But please get up and walk two days with me. What was he thinking when he left home to find healing in Jesus for his son? What was he thinking? I wonder how that conversation went with his wife. While his son is dying in the bedroom down the hall from an unidentified illness that nobody he has called so far can heal. The the royal official catches Mrs. Royal Official in the hall and he whispers to her that, that he heard about a guy that just got back from Jerusalem and is visiting friends over in Cana for a few days. And, and he tells her, he tells Mrs. Royal Official, he says, I, I know our beloved youngest son is dying and if I leave for four days, two days there and two days back, it's possible that our beloved son may die while I'm gone. And I know that I could send one of our slaves to make the journey and touch Jesus and fetch Jesus for us while I stay here with you. I know that'd be easier and it'd mean that I, I, I most certainly would not miss the death of our son. And I know that the only other miracle anybody around here has seen him perform, this man that's up in Cana, 
The only miracle that anyone's seen him perform is that water into wine trick at the wedding that we missed. And, and I know that nobody really cares for my boss, the king. And the wine guy up there in Cana probably doesn't either. But hear me out, honey. I think, I think you should stay here and take care of our dying son alone for the next 96 hours. Have you ever been there? At a place where there's nothing that you can reasonably do to make something or someone well. And so you start pondering the most irrational, far-fetched and mildly irresponsible course of action. A plan you might pursue may potentially bring added stress and worry to the people that you love. The course of action you're considering calls for a sacrifice of precious time that you can never get back. The plot that you are concocting comes with odds for success that are stacked against you. And so you just keep it to yourself. Or you whisper it in the ear of just one person who quickly reminds you that here in the real world, Miracles like the one you imagine might happen don't. And after you snap back to your senses, you retreat back into the dark room where you keep all the woulda, coulda, shouldas. The good ideas and the lost opportunities that you have been collecting over time. And once you're back in there, in that dark room, you wait for the inevitable arrival of one more death that you and all the reasonable people said we could do nothing about. Just wait. You know, Capernaum is a, it's a real place. The Jewish historian Josephus mentions it in his writings and there are other ancient Jewish writings in the Talmud that that do the same, that note where Capernaum was and that it existed. Capernaum is real, as real as the fact that kids with high fevers that don't come down will eventually die. There's nothing we can do about it. Capernaum is real, as real as the fact that royal officials representing kings should get what they deserve if their kings are corrupt. There's nothing you can do about it. Capernaum is real, as real as the facts that we've come to believe that in America, access to quality health care is not a basic human right but a privilege that we earn. Second chances are for those that can afford it. Divisions between people are just a fact of life. And generosity, well, that's the opposite of justice. Capernaum is real. By our standards, Cana is not. The Gospel writer of John is responsible for all three recorded mentions of Cana anywhere in all of recorded history. There's plenty of reason for us to conclude that the royal official should have just stayed put in reality over there in Capernaum, the real place, instead of packing a bag to go to Jesus. Cana should have been a figment of his imagination, something that he entertained for a while, but let go once he realized he was in Capernaum the place where reality goes to live. Cana should have just been a figment of his imagination, a fictional place that you go when reality's more than you can bear. But this royal official with a deathly ill son went anyway, two days, Two days gone from his son, unaware of his condition when he arrived at Jesus' feet. He's got no leverage, no negotiating strategy, nothing 
but himself and fresh memories of his son's quiet suffering. And once he arrived, he asked Jesus for justice. Come with me. Come with me and heal him, Jesus. And the gospel writer doesn't record him doing more than just begging and saying, Sir, come down before my little boy dies. But what more does he have to say? Is there anything else that's necessary for anybody to hear? This situation is not fair or just. His son didn't do anything to deserve the punishment of death. Capernaum is real, but fathers aren't supposed to grieve the death of their children. Capernaum is real, but what justice is served in a world where children who can't spell justice die from hunger because they had the bad fortune of just being born in the wrong place, the wrong time. Capernaum is real, but what justice is served when the privilege of being healed is reserved for children who can afford to have their parents miss work, to take them to the doctor. Capernaum is real. What does that make Cana? Well, to me... Cana looks like the kingdom of God. All Jesus had to do, says the Father, is come down from Cana. Bring Cana to Capernaum. And you may be tempted at this point in the sermon to ask what the Cana, what Cana and the feverish son and the desperate father and Jesus have to do with the subject of this whole sermon series that we're going to be on for seven weeks. This sounds to me like just another healing story. People are sick all the time around Jesus, you might say. Preacher, some of them are even dead before Jesus gets there. This is just Jesus being Jesus. It's what he does. But to generalize this healing as just another one in a long line of miracles that only the Son of God could do is to ignore who was healed and why it happened. The Father begged Jesus to return with him to Capernaum, to bring Cana to Capernaum, but Jesus chose not to go. Instead, he healed him from a distance. Why is this worth noting? Well, it's another two days to get back to Capernaum, and the father's already been gone for to himself. Who can say that the extra two days of travel back to Capernaum may have been more than the son had to wait. If the son died while they were coming down to Capernaum from Cana, Jesus would not have been faulted and the almost in time miracle would probably not be included in John's gospel. Capernaum's real, remember? People who lived there would have said, nice try, but we told you so. Should have stayed here. You wouldn't have missed your son's death. It was nice of Jesus to make an attempt, but it is what it is. That's what people say that live in reality in Capernaum. It is what it is. But in Cana, the constraints of reality aren't just suspended. They are subverted twisted around, turned inside out. The box is flipped over. Everything is dumped out. Something else is put in. Then the box is collapsed. Everything falls out. Jesus would have been just in trying. But instead, he chose to be generous with his healing. And he gave the royal official from the court of a king that everybody hated immediate release from the pain of grief and loss 
and helplessness that the royal official, a father, carried in his body. Irrational expressions of generosity are how you can tell healing justice from justice that makes you wait. The son was sick, but the trauma of facing death was shared up and down the family tree. By announcing the miracle immediately, Jesus ensured that not another minute of pain would pass through the father or the son. He could go home in peace immediately. Justice that makes you wait is different. Justice that makes you wait says the time's not right for us to talk about our willful ignorance of the pain that racism causes in the bodies of black and brown people, all people of color in this world. Give it two more days. Justice that makes you wait says, well, a couple of generations more must pass before systemic injustice is undone. There's nothing we can do about it right now. Just give it two more days. Justice that makes you wait says, you know, keep your place. Don't ask too many questions. Enjoy your freedom. Your health is good, isn't it? Be thankful for what you have. Two more days. Healing justice is different. It is generous in the time that it returns to the people who have acted out of faithful irrationality to demand that people in a position to do something actually do it. Healing justice can be found in Cana. Now it can be found in Capernaum as well. I think there's a place for everybody in this story. You may not have ever been so sick that death was imminent like the young son of the royal official, but all of us have been helpless at one time or another. And you may have never been a parent like the father of the young son, with an inexplicable fever. But all of us know what it's like to worry deeply about the well-being of someone close to us. And you may not have ever called yourself the Son of God, like Jesus, but all of us can recall a time when we were asked to help heal. And so what we're witnessing is much more than another miracle story that should signal to us that Jesus is special, one of a kind, extraordinary, worth our attention, maybe even the Son of God. No, there is something else that's being healed here, being made brand new in addition to the desperate father's Son, the son got well, but for that to happen, Cana had to go to Capernaum, and Capernaum had to come up to Cana. Reality had to be ignored. People acted irrationally. Standard conventions were set aside, never to be messed with again. And Jesus had to redefine justice as healing that is generous. And so what will you do now that you thought could wait?